The completed roof frame of the building we are constructing, you'll remember, will look like this when we've finished it. Using a scale model so we can see details more clearly, we also remember that we have so far learned to lay out and cut the common rafter. Another type of rafter, which we must cut for the building, is the hip jack rafter. This is similar to a common rafter, but meets the hip rafter instead of going all the way through to a ridge board. We can see this if we imagine that we simply have a gable roof changed to a hip roof. When it is changed, these common rafters become hip jacks, exactly in this manner. The major difference is that now they must be cut at an angle to fit the hip rafter in the same way that the hip rafter itself is cut at an angle to fit the ridge board. To understand how these rafters are cut, let's look at another drawing, one of a perfectly flat zero pitch roof. The cut here at the end of the jack rafter and here where a hip meets the ridge board are now 45 degree miter cuts in this flat roof. Now notice that as the ridge board and rafters rise, the angle of cut becomes more and more acute, and we have a longer and longer point on the end of the rafter. To illustrate the method of laying out the cut on the hip jack rafter, let's go back to the flat roof and lay a square on the hip jack rafter, the other leg of it extending along the top plate to the corner of the building. Looking down on the roof, we notice that distance A is the same as distance B. In other words, the run of the jack rafter is exactly the same as the distance between the center line of the jack rafter and the corner of the building. Therefore, to get the cut at this end of the rafter, we flop the square over and hold the line length of the rafter on one leg of the square and the run of the rafter on the other leg. Assuming that the cut has not yet been made, the stock will extend on through in this manner. The cut is then established here. Although for purposes of illustration, we have used line length and the run of the rafter, in actual practice we would use the length of one unit of rafter, which we will generally call the bridge measure, and unit of run, which you'll remember is 12 inches. In this perfectly flat roof, these two dimensions are the same. But as the roof rises and the slope becomes steeper and steeper, the line length of the rafter becomes longer and longer. The cut, however, is made in exactly the same manner. The bridge measure, or unit of rafter, on one side of the square, the unit of run on the other side of the square, will produce the cut. Notice that the side cut line falls on the bridge measure side of the square. Now on this model, notice another difference between the jack and the common rafter. While the run of the common rafter of our building is one half the span, the run of the jack rafter is less. Because of an optical illusion, the outside rafters do not appear to be square. However, they are. See too that each pair of jack rafters forms a perfect square with the edge of the top plate. If the center of the first jack rafter is spaced 16 inches from the corner of the building, the run of the first jack will be 16 inches. Now, let's see how the principles we've seen work out in actually laying out a jack rafter. You'll remember that the cut of our roof is 6 and 12. We hold 6 and 12 on the square then on the edge of the rafter stock and draw the first or line length mark on the unit of rise side. Since this jack rafter has a run of 16 inches, we must lay out the 16 inches of run on the stock. To this point, we've laid out one unit, or 12 inches, of run. We now slide the square down and lay out another four inches, which gives us the 16 inches necessary. We then slide the square down and draw the second line through the point we've established. Notice that we continue to hold 6 and 12, as always, not 6 and 16. This line indicates the edge of the top plate, 
and in our rafter is finally cut, it will sit here, as you see. We must now proceed to lay out the projection for the eaves. We do it in the same manner as we did with the common rafter. Sliding the square down, still holding our usual 6 and 12, and measuring off what amounts to 18 more inches of run to give us 18 inches of projection to match the 18 inch projection of the common rafter tail. The bird's mouth is laid out in the same way as we did for the common rafter. We must be sure that the distance above the bird's mouth and the jack rafter is exactly the same as it is above the one in the common rafter. So we go back to the common rafter pattern and measure the distance above the bird's mouth Transfer this measurement to the hip jack stock and strike off the level line completing the bird's mouth. If this measurement is not carefully taken, we may get an uneven, wavy line in the completed roof. We're now ready to shorten the rafter. If we were to carry this line length mark up to the center of the stock, we would find that it would fall at this point in the center of the hip rafter. Obviously, this would not be possible. The rafter must be shortened. Since on a level plane, the hip jack rafter meets the hip rafter at an angle of 45 degrees, the amount of shortening will be one half the thickness of the hip rafter taken on a 45 degree line. Find out what this distance is, we draw a 45 degree line across the back of a piece of rafter stock. We divide this distance in half and find out that this rafter must be shortened one and one eighth inches. This distance is measured off at right angles to the line length mark, transferred to the edge of the rafter stock and carried to the center of the top of the rafter. We're now ready to lay out the side cut. It will be made by holding the bridge measure, in this case 13 and 7 16 inches, on one leg of the square, and the unit of run for this rafter, 12 inches, on the other leg. We then draw the line on the bridge measure side, and a new plumb line is struck off. With the layout complete, the hip jack rafter is cut. It looks like this, and will fit the hip rafter here. On the roof model, this is the hip jack rafter, which we have just finished. Notice that the next one alongside it runs exactly twice as far. Therefore, it'll obviously be twice as long, before shortening, of course. And the third one, similarly, will be three times as long. Now let's move up and look at the valley jack rafters. The same principles of layout may be applied to them as to the hip jacks. The run of a valley jack rafter may be determined by the distance between the center of it, where it meets the ridge board, and the point where the two ridge board center lines intersect. Since that distance, as you can see, is the same as the valley jack run. The side cut of the valley jack is produced in the same way as the side cut of the hip jack. The major differences between hip and valley jacks are, first, that the valley jack meets the ridge board, and so has a plumb cut on that end, and of course, must be shortened in the same way that we shortened the common rafter. Second, the valley jack naturally does not have a tail, but meets the valley rafter here. It has a side cut and must be shortened the same amount that we shortened the hip jack. Next, the cripple rafters, reaching between the hip rafter and the valley rafter. Since the hip and valley run parallel, all cripples naturally are the same length. Any cripple then will fit here, and here, and also here. 
As we look down on the crippled rafter at this point, notice the perfect square it forms with the two edges of the top plates and the hip jack rafter. The run of the crippled rafter then is the same as the distance between the point where the wing meets the main structure and the outside corner of the building. This must be so since this distance is equal to this distance, being two sides of the square form. In our own particular building, this measurement, the run of the cripple, is four feet. The cripple is stepped off just as the common and jack rafters were. We must put side cuts at both ends, however, and both ends must also be shortened. The amount of shortening for each end, one and one-eighth inches, is identical with the shortening of the hip jack rafter. For convenience, we add both measurements together and take two and one quarter inches off of one end. The side cuts are made by holding the bridge measure on one side of the square and the unit of run on the other and drawing the line, as usual, on the bridge measure side. When we're finished, the cripple will look like this and will fit between hip and valley rafters, as you see here. There are two other rafters which we must learn to cut in order to complete the roof. One is the valley rafter. The other is the hip rafter. These two rafters have to support other rafters, so we cut them out of heavier stock. In laying out these rafters, the 12 inch unit of run, which we've always used with other rafters, will no longer apply. The reason is this. Since hip rafters, and of course valley rafters also, move in toward the center of the building on a diagonal line, it's obvious that they have to travel farther than a common rafter to get to the same place. In other words, the hip rafter then has a longer total run than the common rafter. The total rise, though, naturally remains the same as that of the common rafter, since both rise to the same height above the walls of the building. Translating these totals to units, this means that we will still hold the same unit of rise on our builder's square, but a new unit of run. Now, we'll see what this new unit of run is. Two jack rafters, placed here in our zero-pitch roof, will each travel 12 inches to meet the center line of the hip rafter. Notice that the hip rafter now travels across the diagonal of a square. The diagonal of this square, measuring 12 inches on each side, is 16.97 inches long, or for all practical purposes, 17 inches. So we've established a new unit of run, 17 inches which is used only with the hip and valley rafters. This then is what we hold on the steel square. Six inches as the unit of rise and 17 inches as the unit of run. Using these measurements, we draw the first plumb line, which we will call the line length mark. It corresponds to the center of the building where the hip rafter meets the ridge board. In the same way as we've always done, we lay off a total of 12 units, one for each unit of common rafter run. After we've laid out all 12 units, we must lay out the projection, producing the tail of the hip rafter. To see how to do this, let's look at this plan view of the hip rafter and two jack rafters each jack rafter having the same projection as the common rafters in the building, 18 inches. This 18 inch projection we can represent by this line, 18 inches long, and by this line, also 18 inches long. When we close the square, of which these two lines are two sides, we see that the tail of the hip rafter runs from corner to corner of it, forming its diagonal. So, to find out the run of the tail of the hip rafter, we lay out the two sides of the 18 inch square on any flat surface and measure across the diagonal with a rule. We find that the tail of the hip rafter runs 25 and 7 16 inches, which we lay out on the stock. 
This distance then, 25 and 7 16 inches, becomes the projection of the hip raptor and produces its tail. We must now shorten the hip raptor. And to do this, we follow the same procedure we've used before. One half the diagonal thickness of the ridge board is one and one eighth inches, which we lay off on the side of the raptor at right angles to the plumb line, transfer to the edge of the raptor stock, and carry to the center of the top of the raptor. The next step is to lay out the side cut. In the finished rafter, it will look like this. And will fit against the ridge board like this. The side cut at the top end is produced in the same way as the side cut on the jack rafter. But remember that this cut is based on the bridge measure of the hip rafter and the unit of run of the hip rafter. Or, in our case, an 18 inch bridge measure and a 17 inch unit of run. Since the tongue of the square is too short to hold either of these figures, we simply divide them both in half and hold nine and eight and a half to produce the angle. The line as usual is drawn on the bridge measure side to produce the side cut mark. We are now ready to lay out the tail cut of the hip rafter. You'll remember that it looks like this. The cut is made in much the same manner as the top side cut was made. We hold the bridge measure and the unit of run and draw a line on the bridge measure side. Reversing the square and repeating the process gives us the other half of the combination side cut. A new plumb line for the tail cut is drawn on both sides of the stock and it's ready for cutting. Cut and in place, it projects like this at the eaves line of the roof. We are now ready to lay out the bird's mouth. To see why we lay it out as we do, let's go back to the roof model and use a hip rafter purposely left unsecured and cut especially for demonstration purposes. You'll note that when we've laid out the line length of the hip rafter, we've reached the corner of the building. With the bird's mouth cut square at this point, as has been the case with all the other rafters, it fits against the building like this, as you can see with these demonstration pieces. The flat surface of the bird's mouth touching only the sharp edge of the top plate corner. We want to make it fit more tightly. To do this, we first cut off the corner of the top plate like this. The amount we cut off, measured straight in on a level line, will always be equal to one half the thickness of the rafter stock. Now, continuing our demonstration, suppose we lay the square cut bird's mouth of the hip rafter into place to see how we stand. See what's wrong? That's right. The plumb cut has to be moved in. With this done, we have a good fit against the cutoff corner of our top plate. Now let's check the fit of this rafter along its length. Here's the fit at the top end, and it's not good. Notice that the long point of the rafter sticks up above the ridge board if we are to hold the center of our rafter flush with the top. And here's how it fits the jack rafters. No good again. With the jack rafters in the proper position, as we see here, the roof sheathing would have to be bent up at the ends. Obviously, something else must be done. This something else is known as lowering the hip rafter. So that the top end is flush with the ridge board as it should be, and of course, cutting away this section of the ridge board. In lowering the hip, we must also lower the rafter at the bottom where it meets the plate. On this demonstration hip rafter, here is the plumb line of the rafter before it was moved. This distance, measured down on the plumb line, is equal to that of a common rafter. You'll remember that we moved at one half the thickness of the rafter stock. 
Here is the plumb line after it's moved. If we hold the same distance on the new plumb line as we did on the old plumb line, we automatically get the amount necessary to lower the rafter. With the bird's mouth cut on the new line, it moves into proper position. With the rafter properly dropped, the hip jacks now fit tightly to the hip rafter and no longer project above it. Laying out the hip rafter bird's mouth in accordance with these principles is a very simple matter. First, we move the plumb line of the bird's mouth in toward the building. We move it half the thickness of the rafter stock so that it will fit properly after the corner of the top plate has been cut off. Next, we check the common rafter to determine the distance to the top of the rafter stock above the bird's mouth. This we find is four and one half inches. We measure that distance down the new plumb line and strike it off to form the seat of the bird's mouth. Note here that if we had measured down the original plumb mark representing the actual building line, the seat cut would lie here. So, by using this new plumb line to measure on, we've raised the seat cut this much and the rafter has been lowered the same amount. So that the tail of the hip will look the same as the tail of the common and jack rafters, it's reduced in width. The new width is equal to the plumb line of the common rafter. When cut, it may be used as a pattern for the other hip rafter. Which, of course, at the top end, will have an exactly opposite side cut. So that the two hips will fit to the ridge board like this. The valley rafters are laid out in very nearly the same way. At the top, after shortening the rafter in the same manner that we did with the hip rafter, we lay off the other side of the combination side cut. And since the tail must look like this, we produce this type of combination side cut at the tail cut mark. The line length of the valley rafter runs from the center of the building to the inside corner. So, if the bird's mouth were cut off square, here at the line length mark, it would sit at this point. So here again, as you can see, we have had to move the plumb line. Notice, though, that this time we've moved it in the opposite direction from that of the hip rafter, moved it away from the building. This done, the bird's mouth fits as it should, in this manner. When the valley rafter is in position, jack and cripple rafters will be a little above the edge of it. We don't raise the rafter, however. The roof sheathing can easily be nailed to its center the way it stands. To summarize the layout of the hip and valley rafters, here are the major points to remember. While the side cut at the top of a hip rafter looks like this, the valley rafter has a combination side cut which looks like this. The tail cut of the hip rafter is in the form of a point, while the tail cut of a valley rafter is a notch. The bird's mouth of a hip rafter is moved toward the building and the seat cut is raised, causing the rafter to lower. But the bird's mouth of a valley rafter moves away from the building and no lowering or raising of the rafter is necessary. When all of the rafters have been put up, our roof is completely framed and ready for the shingles.